My name is Kathy Hirsch and I'm interviewing Joyce Deal in her living room. Today is June the 10th, 2010. And uh, Joyce, how old are you? 91. 91. Tell us about your birth, where you were born and your parents, where they came from. Oh, let's see. My, my mother was born in Sunderland, England and came to the United States when she was three and a half. I have a picture of her in her little white dress, her little white gloves, her little white hat, and her little white shoes. It's a beautiful little picture. Uh, my father was born in Orlando, Florida, and I know that his father was born in Georgia, but I never had sense enough to ask where, so I don't know that. But uh, mother was all English in her background, and my father was English, Irish, Scotch, and Dutch, is what I have heard from my father of his family. And that's all I can tell you about that. He was born in Orlando and uh, rode horseback back and forth to Winter Park, to Rollins, to go to school. And then I wound up at Rollins because he wanted me to go there and it was a good choice. And what did you study there? Just the regular uh, English history and things like that, just a regular uh, uh, course, and courses. And you actually got a degree from there or? Uh, what'd they call it, AB is it? A Bachelor of Arts? Yeah, mm -hmm. AB. Okay. Hadn't and thought of that in a long time, woo. <laughs> What kinds of things were you interested in growing up as, as a young girl? What was I interested in? Mm -hmm. Art. Always, always art. Where uh, did that come from, do you think? The family wasn't sure. My mother was a natural pianist. She played most beautifully for the church and for everything and never had a lesson. She gave we three, my sister and brother and myself, piano lessons. That sister and brother took to it pretty good. I kept begging for art lessons, <laughs> but I, I didn't take to the piano, and mother could play and never had a lesson, could play anything. So as a child, did you used to draw a lot or paint? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. In fact, when I went to Miami High, uh, now I forget what it was. They had the little contest for whatever symbol we were going to have. And I did a little one <laughs> and submitted it. And I won. I think they still have it. Uh, and they said, well, we have selected you, but would you make us a larger size? <laughs> I remember that very good. So where were you actually born then? I was born in what is called Buena Vista of Miami, which is off of Biscayne Boulevard and Northeast 36th Street. Mm -hmm. And how did your parents get down here? Well, my father uh, was living in Fort Pierce, his family on Indian River there. And so when he became an adult, he started grocery stores. He had one in Daytona and one in Fort Pierce, and then he decided he'd get one in Miami. Miami was coming along pretty, pretty much in growth by then. So he came down. and. His grocery store was on the southwest corner of Flagler Street and Miami Avenue. Right in the heart of downtown. Right in the heart, uh -huh, right in the heart. And I know that my brother, who was about two and a half years older than myself, we'd go down to the store when Mother let us, and then we would run up to the bridge at the river and look down and watch the beautiful fish swimming. You couldn't see a fish now. You couldn't even see the bottom of the Miami River. But if when we were there, we'd tell them we were going to run up to the bridge, which is only like a block. And we'd go up there and spend time looking down into the fish swimming around. It was beautiful. What was Flagler Street like in those days? Uh, well, we had the Red Brooks to the road. And so when it rained, if they have a big puddle, sometimes they come up. And I know that my brother and I spent many an hour 
putting Brooks back down where they belong. But we did, we enjoyed it. it. Gave us something to do when we would be down at the store, not in school or something. Oh, one thing I remember was when they built the courthouse. We had a beautiful courthouse building there, beautiful lawn and trees. Then they decided to build the one that's there that was huge when we were little. And when they finally opened it, my brother and I, my sister was not an active one. She was more quiet and everything. But he and I ran all the way to the top, up those stairs. Gosh, I don't think I could run 10 of them now. <laughs> but when we got up there, the prison was up there. Up the stairs? Up at the top, at the very top was the prison. And so, when we finally got up there, well, we just racked up running, because when you're that little, you can run all the way up. We got up there, and there was a guard up there, and he said, oh, I think that you better go in and see, and he shut the door on us. He says, you're in prison now. <laughs> I don't know that we were scared. I think we understood, and I can't remember how we reacted. I think it was a little bit of a shock, but I don't think it upset us at all, you know. And then he immediately opened it and let us out. He said, now you can always say you have been in prison. <laughs> Did you ever it use that just, later on? Did you ever bring that up? No, I don't think I ever brought it up before. I hadn't thought about the courthouse, but the courthouse to us was monstrous. See, we had nothing that was more than three stories, I suppose, all of Flagler Street. I remember Sewell Sewell's shoe store, and they had the elevator that you could see out and watch everything down below because it was just iron grating, which is be, was very interesting when you're small and you had to go upstairs to get your shoes. And in those days, they took this thing you put your feet on and they measure your foot this way and measure your foot to the width and then go get a pair of shoes. You go in now, you better just take care of yourself. <laughs> Find the shoes yourself. In but, those days, do you recall, were there signs over the water fountains restricting one for black people and one for white people? Oh, I do remember that, yes. And do you remember My father time? was very opposed to that. And he sat us down. My brother came home, and he had a little black friend. And he came home and referred with the N-word. But they were friends. Mm -hmm. And he said, called my sister and my brother and myself to sit down on this porch, between the porch we had. And he said, now I have to tell you that even though you don't realize what you said, it is not proper. Now, he was born in Orlando, and his father was born in Georgia. And he was raised with no race prejudice. Uh, he sat us down, and he said, I've told this story to some of the people in the past, not many times. I thought he did it so beautifully. He said, you know, when God created your heart, he had to find a place so that you would have a body, and he had to find a mother that would be able to raise you. And it just so happens that he, at the time, available was your mother to place your spirit. So you turned out to be white. But it could have been that your, the lady that was ready would be black, and your heart would be placed in her, and you would have been born black. So how can you say that God does not know what he's doing? My father, do you know that I've told that story to some people that are a little bit on the not so tolerant. Boy, were we ever raised that you could be, your heart could have been in any 
any color. And how would you feel if that was you? That stuck with me, and I swear I wasn't, what, four or five? And you still remember that? Oh, I will always remember. I can see my father sitting right there on that screened-in patio, porch-like thing. You can still? Sounds like he was a very good man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your father. Well, he was a hard-working man, and uh, he met my mother when she came down on a ship from New Jersey. They went over, I guess, to New York and she took the Clyde line down for the winter and they were gonna come all the way to Miami, and they got off the ship in Fort Pierce and fell in love with it, so she and her mother, her father was already gone. Uh, they decided they'd stay in this small town, right there on the water, very pretty. And so mother went to work, and where did she, oh, she took a course in shorthand, and she went to work, and where did she go to work? in my father's <laughs> and so that's where she met my dad uh, yeah so she she was doing his bookkeeping and all kinds of stuff for him in Fort Pierce uh -huh. and uh, so did they ever tell a story about their meeting was it love at first sight or? well she told me that they got off of the train and he was there to and I can't remember for what, but he was there for to either meet somebody or get a delivery or something because he had the grocery stores. He had one in Daytona and one in, in Fort Pierce. And then later they opened one here in Miami. Uh, but she said they decided the train was going to wait a little bit. I don't know, they had 20 minutes or something while they were there. So they decided to get off, she and her mother. And she said, John, as she called my dad, was standing there and he was had white pants and a white shirt on. And he was so handsome, she said, I fell in love with him right there. So she didn't want to leave Fort Pierce and I don't know, I can't tell you too much more about the rest of it. But so it wasn't just that it was a pretty place, there was a good looking guy there. Yeah, there was a good. I get it. <laughs> Oh, she said, I, she said, I never thought you could just fall in love with somebody, but he was standing there and it was almost dark and he was all dressed completely in white and I don't remember why he was there. I guess she told us, but I have no idea. But isn't that something? And she fell in love with him before she got off the train. Well, I mean, she, you know, Looking out most, most attracted to him, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. So grandmother said, all right, we'll stay in Fort Pierce for a while. So they rented a place, and uh, next thing you know, we had a marriage. Mm -hmm. And my sister was born there, my brother was born there, and I was conceived in Fort Pierce, but I was born in Miami. So you've seen a lot of changes in Miami since oh, you were born. Oh, you never know. Mm -mm. What are the most impressive changes to you? I guess the, I don't know if I should say this, but the change from our regular English, etc., to the Cuban life. Now, I'm not against Cubans, they're just the same as me, but they took over the whole county. and. Uh, it was a little hard for me for a while. You So you went to grade school and high school here? Yes, I went to Carl Gables Elementary, and then I went one year at Ponce de Leon, because we were living in Carl Gables. And then we moved into Shenandoah. I don't know if you know Shenandoah. Uh, that'd be like. 22nd Avenue, I think, and south of, like, south of 8th Street, Shenandoah. There's a nice school there. We moved there, and so I went in the 8th uh, and ninth grade. 
to Shenandoah and then to Miami High. Leah, would you like to take over here now and ask about high school experiences? And what were the schools like back then, the education experience? What was it? I didn't. You say a little louder. What was the education experience like back then? Oh, it was wonderful. No, we had wonderful teachers. We had kind, interested teachers, which I'm sure they are now. I don't know because I don't see them. But they were, we had wonderful, wonderful teachers. I will say one thing. I don't know if they still have patience, but they had patience with us. Even over at Miami High, I remember algebra was something a little bit difficult for me. <laughs> and we had the nicest math teacher. She, she, times she got through really helping us. We knew algebra. So I always appreciated that. I can remember her. Mrs. Delaney, I think her name was. She had the patience of anything because it was algebra was so different from anything awesome. and uh, <laughs> I guess it's simple to you now mm -hmm. but uh, it wasn't to us but I can remember how kind and nice she was about it uh, see I went to Carl Gables Elementary one year at Ponce de Leon and then Shenandoah and then Miami High, and then Rollins. Uh -huh. And Ra I was gonna go to Duke, all my friends were going to Duke. I write home as a counselor at camp in Mentone, Alabama, and I write home, Dad, you got it all arranged for me to go to Duke. He'd write back and say, yes, you're all scheduled and you're all registered at Rollins. <laughs> That's where he went. Well, I'm so glad, really. It was a wonderful school. So he wasn't going to consider Duke at all? Oh, no. I was going to Rollins. That's where he went. That's where he <laughs> lived. And that, that I was going there, or I, I guess I don't know what else would happen, but I'm happy about it. You said um, your mother was pretty English through and through. I think you, your mother was very English. She uh, was yes, English. but she, she was only three and a half when she came over. So she was more Americanized than a lot of people. She didn't do tea at four o'clock or? Uh, her mother did. And she said she can remember her mother did sewing for the Rockefellers, the Mellons, the, all those families. It's, I've got beads and everything here that was hers, which I don't know what to do with. Uh, but her mother would send her to the store maybe for a spool of white, pink thread or something, or whatever she'd send her for. And she would try to imitate her mother's, uh, was it please or? Anyway, the English pronunciation or whatever it was she was sent for. And she said, I'd stutter around with it and then I'd just have to say it in the way we would talk. <laughs> she was trying to use the British she says, I can remember how foolish it was me trying to put the English accent on the funny little things you remember that your mother told you. Yeah. After you got out of Rollins, what did you do? I came down, uh, came back home, and I went to work for the Miami Daily News. It was the first job I could get, and it was real nice. And the first thing you know, uh, they opened the office. That's where I got all these pictures. Where's that stack of pictures? We'll find it afterwards. Oh. First thing you know, they put me down in the DuPont building on the ground floor of Flagler and 2nd Avenue, where the bridge is, you know, 2nd Avenue Bridge. <laughs> and they made me manager of the downtown office where we took in classified, we took in stories, we did this, we did that, and they did a lot of movies down there and all. And every day they would send down these big pictures that came from what would be the big, big place, New York or something, uh, and they, we would put them in the window on, on 2nd Avenue. And I kept them. I got a stack like this. And that's why I was looking for the, 
the museum and then it said it's going to be on art. What do you think some of the most interesting stories you did were? I couldn't hear you. Some that. of the most interesting stories that you did while you worked for the paper? I get in death. Um, they, young people talk so fast. Now. Well, no, it's, I know, some but I, the, I know that I am starting to get there. Some of the interesting stories that you did while you worked for the Daily News? Oh, Some of your favorite oh, I got a better one. I got to go to uh, Los to Los Angeles on This Is Your Life. <laughs> I've had a wonderful life. I've been treated <laughs> so good. <laughs> Tell us about that. Uh, How did you get there first? Of well, all? I was working managing the office. What I went to work for the railroad during the war, and then the men were coming home. And I had a friend, Tilly Jones, that was working with the, uh, with the railroad, and she said, you know, the men are coming back, and you've got to be looking for a job, because we, we wanted them to have their job back. So she, that she heard, I can remember so well, she was with Freight, and, but we, we were, had become good friends. And I was in the uh, ticket office at uh, Second Avenue and Flagler. This is after the Daily News experience. Yes. Right. Yeah, I'm okay, with the so doctors. Now, now, now I'm with okay. the Dr. Palmer, Chandler, Vincent, Lawson, Clower, and Walt. So you're working at a doctor's office? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was doing all the hiring and firing of nurses. <laughs> they got this best friend that I have to use her head. But it was, it was really nice. And of course, Dr. Palmer was world known then. It wasn't just that he later became, and they had the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. He was world known. They came from all over the world. Well, he did the first bilateral corneal transplant on a young woman. So Ralph Edwards with, had had a program called This Is Your Life called Dr. Palmer, or called the office, and asked to speak to him, and he did. And he wanted Dr. Palmer to come out uh, because they had read that he had done the first bilateral, that's both eyes. Well, of course, you know, but I mean, this is the first for two eyes. Uh, corneal transplant. Them, they usually do them one at a time, right? No, he did them one at a time a year apart. Mm -hmm. But nobody had ever done two, and it was almost a year apart. So Ralph Edwards, does anybody remember the program? Oh, you do. Uh, this is your life? Well, so they contacted him, and he said, no, I can't do it. And they said, well, can you send somebody to represent you? And he said, yes, I'm sure I can. Well, my husband was Navy, and at this particular moment, he happened to be on a two-week leave, and I hadn't seen him in over a year. <laughs> so we had a bunch of people at the house. We were in Pinecrest on 101 Street, and uh, had a friend's in, and the call came, and I said, oh, no, no, I, I can't. I can't leave. I said, I haven't seen my husband in a year, and he's home, and he's going to be here two weeks. So they get back with Dr. Palmer, and they arranged it that when, if I would go, they would send me back through Norfolk, and Dr. Palmer would give me a week in Norfolk. <laughs> so that all worked out good. So I got to be on that program, and I remember uh, how lovely it was. And of course, where we were here, we had a our, um, uh, mango and avocado groves. So we sent fruit out, I guess it was avocados at that time, whatever was in, out to where I had been on This Is Your Life. And I've got the letter where they wrote back thanking us for the fruit and, you know, this kind of stuff. But I've had so much fun. Tell us about meeting your husband. Oh. All right. I met him at the residence home on Star Island, the home of uh, 
John Levi, who was mayor of Miami Beach. I happened to have a date with his stepson, and the party was there. So uh, he had to stay in the line, receiving line, you know. This is Christmas time. And he said, I have, but he says, walk on down to the dock. He had two friends pick him up, two young boys pick me up, bring me over there. He said, walk on down uh, to the bench down by the water and I'll be down as soon as I can get out of this line. So I walked down there and <laughs> he had to stay with his family, you know, to greet all the people coming. So. Where was your, your date at this point? Uh, he was, the son. The son was oh, the, he was the one telling you to go down by yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. He was my date, but he had two young friends pick me up at home okay. and take me over there because he could, didn't have the time to do it. So I went down, and the next thing you know, somebody came down, sat down and started talking, my husband. That was my husband. He had seen me go through. He had a date. He left her talking with some friends. <laughs> he came down, and he, we talked a few minutes, and he went back up. And when they were taking me home, she so had friends pick me up because she had to be there. What happened was. I got home, and the next thing you know, my doorbell rang, <laughs> and it was my husband. <laughs> so I, I've had a lot of fun. I really, so what was your reaction when you opened the door? Oh, I was not disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and we, he had another friend with him, and so I got, I got in the front, and he got in, so there were three of us, the car was big enough. And we went all the way up to Hollywood Beach Hotel, the dancing and the music. This is, uh, I don't think it was Christmas Eve, it must have been New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, that's when they had their parties. This is late. And we go all the way up there. Well, and then home, everything was fine. But then I started dating my husband to be. And he had a 42-footer, the idle time the second, and docked it right at the mouth of the Miami River. I've had a wonderful life, a wonderful life. I gather he took you out on the boat a lot. <laughs> I used to help him clean it up when we'd come back in. I can remember, and you would get a laugh out of this, we'd be going out to fish, and of course, pretty big 42-footers at the first size stop to get gas and he put fifty dollars worth of gas in. Fifty dollars. I was making about fifty five dollars a week. <laughs> that was the salary and I, and I had it was one of the top ten or twenty gals in town at fifty five dollars a week and he put fifty fifty dollars <laughs> worth of gas he, what, in there. What did he do for his job? What did he do to work? What did he? For his job. What was his job? Uh, what was he doing? Was he in the Navy by then? No. Gosh, I can't read. I, well, it'll come to me. <laughs> I, you're asking a lot of brain out of him. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> so you went out fishing a lot? Oh, yes, all the time. And was, was fish plenteous? Oh, yes, but the bay was full, just wonderful, yeah. And we go to Flamingo, down to Flamingo, down, yeah. and I remember one time there was a, I think it was a bear, a little bear, and he said, he, he, the road was so bad, sometimes you'd have to stop and cut some palmettos to put under the wheels because of the water and, you know, you get stuck. So we'd do that. But this one time he says, oh, look at the bear. 
since I'm rolling the window down, he says, don't, <laughs> don't roll the window down. <laughs> I guess I was going to root out and reach out and pet it. I don't know what I was going to do. <laughs> Get a better look, probably. What other said, kinds of wildlife did you we see? We had uh, the little baby deer, and this this was a, uh, uh, well, what did I say? It was a lion? Bear. A bear. No, it was a bear. The prettiest little bear you ever want to see, too. Did you see any Seminoles or did you see any Seminoles or Miccosukees? No, but well, we used to have one right on what, 27th Avenue and the bridge? 20, 27th Avenue and the Miami River? We had a whole village there. And they were nice. Right downtown, practically. It what was a big end of the end of the village. What kind of contact did you have with them? I guess the only contact that I had was when I was working with the doctors, Dr. Palmer and that group, uh, in the parking garage, which was right across to the east of Second Avenue, big parking garage, and the uh, Indians were the ones that would you get out of the car and they park it. And do uh, they had and they were, did taxi cabs? I guess they had other uh, jobs in the food place. I don't know. I don't. I don't know about that. But I do know they ran the whole parking garage for, and it was huge. That would be on the uh, southeast corner of Second Avenue and Flagler. And then the Huntington Building was. Uh, right across the street on the same south side. Now, your father still had a store down there? No, no, my father was gone. He was gone. Uh -huh. Tell us about your wedding, and we want to hear about your eventual moving to Pinecrest, but tell us first about getting married. Did you have a fancy wedding or a simple one? I guess you'd call it a simple one. I was dating my husband, whom I loved dearly and was in love with, and <coughs> His family was living over on Hibiscus Island, 225 Hibiscus Island. And then he got, he went and applied at the uh, Orange Bowl. That's where they were signing up the men for the war. And he waited and he waited and he said, gosh, it's a couple of months. So he went down there and he said, what do you, how long is this going to take that I can get into the Navy? And they said, well, we got behind was a lot of you, but they said, you would do it right away. So <clears throat> I'd been going with them then for, I guess, about a year. And uh, <clears throat> so my proposal, you know how we all are ready to say, oh, I do, or whatever we're going to say. And. So we're driving back over to his house. They wanted to, us to come back over there for some something was going on on Star uh, Hibiscus Island. I met him on Star. And I married him on Hibiscus. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so while we're, while we're driving back over, he said, "Honey, do you think we could get ready to get married by Sunday?" You know how you're always ready to say, "Oh." How do you answer that? How do you think you can get ready to get married? He wasn't down on his knee with that. He was question. driving over to <laughs> driving the car, and he did not believe in hugging the girl while he was driving. He said, "When you're driving, you're driving." He says, "When you're necking, you're necking." <laughs> I can hear him right now. <laughs> I bet you hadn't heard that word necking in, in a long time. A long time. <laughs> That's what he said, though. So, so I stayed where I was, and he said, "Hun, do you think you could get ready to get married by Sunday?" How do you say I do? <laughs> I will. <laughs> so we go on over to Hibiscus Island, and so and then he told me, he said, "Of course I wanted to marry you, but I told my parents that it was not right." for me to marry you and not come back after anything could happen. And it says, that seems so unfair. You know what they said to him? Suppose when you come back, she's already married. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, he said, I gotta go. <laughs> Isn't that a sweet one? That is actually what happened. So we went back over there and said, have you said anything? He said, yes, I have, and the answer's good. <laughs> so I'm lucky, aren't I? And yet we had no children, wanted them so badly, and then I wanted to adopt. He says, with your disposition, if they turn out not right, he says, it's going to break your heart. So he was against it, and I would still. I adopt children all, all the time, I'm always my neighbor children. I've got two over here, they're in my trust. I got two over there. <laughs> those are Chinese and those are French. And then I got others, they're all little ones. Judy will tell you, she, she's, she's got the checks, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Well, you're carrying out your father's philosophy. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, okay. So, so you got married. This was prior to uh, Pearl Harbor? This is prior to when he left to go to Europe. Okay. Yeah. So he was on the Europe front, too, European front. He was European front and then the other front. I had a... Uh, cousin, first cousin, was only over here at Pearl Harbor ten days when the big, you know, when they were bombed by the Japanese and he was killed. He's in that ship that they talk about down. Mm -hmm. For young people nowadays, um, they have an idea about 9-11 being that event that that kind of focused the whole country. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Pearl Harbor and where you were when you got the news and what impact it had on you? Oh, it impacted on everyone. It doesn't. It wasn't just just a few of us or those that had relatives. It hit the whole country. It just hit the whole the whole country. Uh, yes, and as I said, I lost. Well, one cousin that had only been over there uh, about 10 days when he, his place was bombed, his ship was bombed, and, uh, he, and we lost him. The other one was a pilot. Uh, they were the two brothers, my first cousins. And he was a pilot, and he was shot down over Germany. But. The Germans had people who were against all this. They really were for no war. They got him and got him better and got him on an underground from house to house to house till he hit the English, cha the English Channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they got him on a ship. He said, did you ever cross a sh uh, whatever it's called, under a whole bunch of potatoes? <laughs> they bury him under sacks of potatoes to get him over to England. And then when he got in England, they sent him then, he was there for a little while, and they sent him, and they sent him all the way to Miami Beach to recuperate. And he called, and we were living on Tiger Tail. 2100 Tiger Hotel, and the phone rang, and uh, this voice said, Hi, Joyce, can I speak to Uncle John? And I said, I don't know who you are, but I think you're very rude. I said, you sound exactly like my cousin that was killed. He said, it's me. And it was. And they had gotten him under the potatoes over to England. They got him flown all the way across. They finally kept him in Washington for an interview. I don't know how many days, a few days. And then they flew him to Miami Beach because that's where they were sending him to recuperate. And so when he calls me and says, hi, Joyce, can I speak to Uncle John? I thought, I don't know who you are, but you are terrible. She so said, no, it really is me, but I want to speak to Uncle John because I don't want to call Mother. She thinks I'm gone, and I want Uncle John to call her first. 
Well, then, of course, I was tickled to death. Didn't know it was all right. But he did lose his brother at Pearl Harbor, 10 days, his brother, younger brother. So Dad got on the phone. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll call Gladys. So he did. And she had lost that son and had this one. She just heard she'd lost this one. And Dad called and said, I have to prepare you about Floyd. He is fine, and he's on Miami Beach, and he wants to call you, but he wanted me to alert you. So she'd like to pass out. I mean, she could faint or anything. So, and I don't think anybody is, has a memory of when we saved every piece of tinfoil. Did you ever hear of that? If you had a candy bar, if you had anything, if you got a package, if you had crackers that had tinfoil, you put it in this ball and then you turned it in. I don't know what the government did with it, but everybody, every house had their, their ball of tinfoil. Well, and you had rationing too. Had what? Rationing. Yes, uh-huh. And you had blackouts here. Oh, too. I've got right here on the table Ration books. Oh, my. Can you put your hand on it? Honey? Well, you know, we I need, talk too much, don't I? We need to oh. move forward a little bit. I was going to say. And uh, talk about, so your husband and you got married, and then what made you decide to move to Pinecrest? Uh, there was a, uh, they put him as commanding over, officer, for the Navy in the headquarters on the Miami River. He said, this is my present they're giving me. And he had a chief, Bob Lewis, that lived right where we are. He lived just a couple of houses down, facing west on Ludlow. And he was a, he was a chief, Bob Lewis. And that's where he lived, and this was all nothing groves. This was a lime grove where we are now. Over there was nothing but woods because we tied pieces of sheet or whatever we had to trees we wanted left and then they bulldozed the rest. Uh, but Bob Lewis and my husband became close and so uh, Ted said that we were going to be looking for a place he said, you ought to drive down where we are. He says, it's lovely down there, and there's nothing much being built, and land is cheap. You got the ledger. Forget what we paid, but of course, we thought it was a lot then, but we knew it was a buy. We did know that. She's got the ledger of what we paid for the records, because it just get dumped and burned, you know. Uh, so Ted said, all right. So uh, Chief Bob Lewis told him where, you know, about Ludlam, but it was called something else then. I guess, I don't remember. And uh, Ted said, I like it. He says, you know, he says, Dad will help us put a grove in. That was my father, because Dad had groves everywhere, and they're down in the Redlands, the Bach Tower, and Fort Pierce, and everything, you know. So, which he did. And he got Dan Moss, a very fine black man, to help him. They had, Dad says, you don't, you don't blast. Is it blast, you call it? Dynamite. dynamite. You don't dynamite for planting a grove, or even a, a tree because you make too many cracks down in the rocks and you don't want that. So you have to get it bulldozed. And so Dan Moss and Dad figured out the lanes and the everything and they watched while they got a machine with a man. And I remember him, he was real nice and I knew his name, I can't call it now. And he did two and a half acres on that side and three acres on the other side and this middle one we used for the house. That was 
two and a half. So we had eight acres. It was really seven and a half, and when Dad had it resurveyed, we had eight. And I remember him saying, that's better than going down to six and, six and a half, <laughs> or seven, or whatever, you know. So, uh, how'd I get on that one? Well, we're talking about your husband and you buying the property. Oh, the, oh the, yeah, Pinecrest. Mm -hmm. So we did, we bought three two and a halves, mm -hmm. but one of them worked out to be three down at the far end. And uh, then we put the groves in and built, I've got pictures of the wooden house being built. And they were beginning to build, I think there's a few of them left over here. They're just beginning to build some southeast of us, small. I think some of those little houses are still there. They had just, I think they had eight or ten. What was going on at the time here? What kind of activity? Right here? Nothing. In Pinecrest? Nothing. Groves? Absolutely nothing. There were no groves planted? Oh yeah, we had some groves. Um, was agriculture the main activity? No, just trees. Just just the pine trees and palmetto and, and things. A lot of them was uh, just a road. It wasn't and we even had, paved, was it? it wasn't yes, it was paved, it was. but it wasn't very wide. You could pass, but it wasn't very wide. And we had mailboxes, you know, the old-fashioned mailboxes? Uh, so you'd drive, it was always on the uh, east side. And we were going to go west, so you'd always pull in and open your be a mailbox and get your mail out. And papers were delivered though. Your newspaper was delivered. I think mostly on bicycles, but I'm not sure. Do you remember a man named Carl Wilden? Carl Wilden? No. Or Mary Carrier? Do you remember the Carrier families? No. I should, but I don't. I don't they lived, um, they had a big 20 acres on um, Kendall and Ludlam. Oh, Kendall and Ludlam, mm -hmm. uh-huh. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think we knew anybody that far up. But we probably got their signature when, I have the picture of the young girl. Uh -huh. uh, she and I rode bicycles around everywhere because when, my, when uh, Mr. Good we called him Old Man Goods because I can't remember his first name, but we always called him Old Man Good. He had uh, eight acres, I think it was, in back of us. We had seven and a half. It didn't worn out, come out, turn out to be reserved. It came out to be eight. But uh, and so when he passed away, I think it was two or three lawyers had bought it, or bought it then, or had bought it, I don't know. So they immediately applied for quarter acres. Well, boy, little Nancy across the street from me, whose picture I got sitting right there, she calls me every once in a while. Uh, we got on our bicycles and we went around and we had the signatures, there's no way we are going to have anything less than an acre. And. You know, we had fun doing that. You'd think that it'd sound like, oh, that was work. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> and we'd see how nice somebody's garage was, and we'd tell them, oh, you keep your garage so neat and pretty and everything where it belongs. <laughs> and others you'd go to look like mine looks like now. I get the car in, though. But we got to know everybody in a way, just and we'd stop them if they were driving, and they never were driving fast. She and I commented that on that. They never were going along. They were always driving slowly. And so we'd stop them and get their signature, and then we went down the road to the end of 101, because down in there there's is a low, kind of low, and across from there, they had some more homes. And we knew this one lawyer was down there and his two young sons. So we said, we'll go talk to him. 
because he, he can help us and he can take this to the county commission. I think I told you this one. Should I repeat it? Yes. Uh, so we went down there, went in. The two boys were like eight and ten, nicest young kids. How old would they be now? Uh, so we asked him if he would take it to the commission. Well, we had a lot of signatures. Wish I had a copy of it. Uh, and he said, well, Joyce, he said, it's a good idea, and I appreciate your thoughtfulness, but commissioners don't like lawyers. I've learned now I don't like lawyers either, but uh, uh, we didn't know that then. He said, the best thing is for you to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So Nancy said, you can do it, Joyce, you can do it. I said, you can back me up, yeah. Okay, so we went down and went up before the commission and they said, yes, okay. We won. I think we were more startled than they were. <laughs> we didn't never, I never thought we could, you know, I never thought we could. But that attorney knew, he said, if I go, you're liable not to get it. If you go, she says, I promise you, you'll get it. And we did. Well, we were so elated. I can show you a picture of her. She, she calls me every once in a while. She lives up in Alabama. And uh, she's been down and visited a couple of times. Were there other things that came up later that you had to, to get petitions about and get active about? Oh, yes, many times. In fact, she'll get a kick out of this. They wanted me to run for the commission. That I couldn't do. I couldn't do. I just couldn't. I don't have the disposition for it, I don't think. And I was busy. I was working, and I had lost my father, and I had my mother, and a Navy husband away. Uh, but I was honored. I thought it was so good. It's an honor to be asked to, to run. Mm -hmm. um, you told me once that you, your husband, was assigned to duty in Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Tell us about that experience. Well, that was wonderful. That's when I was working for Dr. Palmer, Palmer Chandler Vincent, you know, the group. And I have my letter of recommendation that Dr. Palmer wrote. And uh, he said she's leaving and says because of the uh, we, we hate to lose her, but she's leaving because her husband is going to be. He was made executive officer and then commanding officer of the Naval, and he's Navy. He's not air. Naval Air Base in Trinidad. And he says, I've got to have a wife down here as commanding officer. Just So I have Dr. Palmer's letter that says, we regret losing her, but she's in demand by her husband. Sweetest letter. Uh, that's like the time I told you, got to go out and be Ralph Edwards, this is your life, representing Palmer. You were, I've had a wonderful time. You were very attached to Dr. Palmer and his family. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. In fact, you see those two little tables there back to back? Mrs. Palmer gave me those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was so, he like? Oh, finest one. I have to tell you the best joke. He went into the bank to cash a check. He was going to buy a nice present for his wife. And the girl, the teller, said, I don't recognize this signature. <laughs> they had a big joke over that. She did know it was he. But she was being funny because I was always signing his checks. So she, she had, he had your me signature. Sign. Huh? She recognized your signature. Yeah. But not his actual signature. That's right. <laughs> so that was a big joke around the building for a little while because it was funny, you know. But he had already taken me in and told the girl that I would be doing it. And uh, so were lots of people from different countries coming here for eye oh, oh, checkups? Oh, all over the world. 
she was so well known. That's how come Ralph Edwards, well, of course it was, he did do the first bilateral corneal transplant, which gave him a reason uh, to do it. But they came from everywhere. And he was, I remember one time they had him down the Rio. They invited him down on some big ophthalmological group meeting as the guest speaker. And uh, oh, he was so honored in this town, and he was so quiet about it. And, so you think he'd be surprised now to see the great big institution with his name on it? Yeah. Well, I think he would, but he was worldwide known. He was worldwide known. And he had a cousin who also was called Bascom. And he walked into the office one day, and uh, so I said, could I help you? Whatever you say, you know. And he said, yes, he said, I want to see Dr. Palmer. And I said, may I tell him who's, who it is, or your name, or something? And he said, yes, it's Bascom Palmer. <laughs> I thought he was being funny, you know. And I looked up at him. He said, it really is. <laughs> I can see him right now. It really is. So, I, I, it's a lot of fun things that you can remember, you know. So um, I know you had mentioned before you were very sad when he passed. Oh, yes. What was, did you go to his funeral? Or? I was in Trinidad. My husband had said I must come down as he was commanding officer. And I got a letter from him after he was gone. Uh, and I got wires from the attorney, from the CPA, from other doctors. I must have had about five telling me that we'd lost him because they knew. I was with him a long time and they knew that I was close with the family. She had two lovely daughters, two lovely daughters. And Helen Palmer was just a wonderful, wonderful woman. Just a wonderful. They lived down on Bay Shore, uh, not too far. Leah, do you have any questions? For um, do you sometimes wish that you had been able to stay with Dr. Palmer? What was that? Please? Do you sometimes wish that you had been able to stay with Dr. Palmer a little longer? Do I have anything? Do you wish that you had been able to stay with Dr. Palmer a little Well, longer? no, because my husband turned out to be commanding officer in the base in Trinidad, and that was a lovely, <laughs> it would be, you're young, you know, and this is great. And here your wife, your husband is this big so-and-so, you know. And what was it this, like in Trinidad? Very there? nice, uh-huh, very nice. Uh, and we were instructed uh, not to drink out of the glasses when we were downtown, use a straw. Uh, but everybody was wonderful, and I got to dance with the, what would he be, the mayor, he wouldn't be the mayor, the head of the island, what would he be? President? No. Prime Minister? <laughs> that might be, yeah, from England, you know. Yeah. And he, he came over and said, may I have the honor of the first dance? And I looked at my husband, and he went, <laughs> I, I said, later, what would you have said? He said, there wasn't anything else to say. <laughs> but first, oh, wonderful life. I have been so blessed, I really have. I don't have any, and I had such a wonderful father and a mother that out of this world. Yeah. Just, she worked at the University of Miami. What did she do there? Uh, in the uh, business office uh, under a man named Mr. Herb, who was very, very nice and depended on her for everything. They had to finally get her a stool to sit on because she had arthritis like I do, the knees and that. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all. Um, can you tell me more about the changes you've seen in Pinecrest over the years? Ooh, that's a big chapter. <laughs> A lot of changes? It's the changes, but the, every one of them been so good. 
absolutely just every step. I don't know if you noticed when you came in the blossom on the tree on the parkway. That's the first time it's blossomed. It is absolutely magnificent. I was going to call up and see if somebody couldn't take a picture of it. It's the first time in all this time that it has bloomed. It's right on the center part, as far as you can't see it, mm -hmm. but the driveway is there, mm -hmm. and it's the first tree. When you drive out, be sure to take a look, and if you have to go out the other way, you're going to have to go back and take a look. It's the first that has bloomed. Beautiful. I don't know the name of it. And I, I go over to Tippies and them and take the newspaper <laughs> after I'm through reading it. They're such a lovely, lovely couple. Uh, they had the, the Chinese. You never heard such beautiful, talented children. They play the piano like an adult. Can't reach the hardly reach the pedals. They came over and gave me an audition or whatever you call it, a, a, a program by the front door in the yard. Uh, and the French children live across the street here, the Lutinis, they come and they play with the dog and he climbs my mango tree out there, swinging upside down and everything and it I doesn't even scare me. My brother and I did it. I know exactly how much fun it is. So I said, if you break a leg, <coughs> I'll help. And how long have you been living here? Oh, Judy? I don't think she knows. For a long time? Yes. Uh, let's see, uh, 74, I think 1974. I could go look. No, that's all right. Okay, so on the about papers. About 30 years old? 74, 84, 94, 104, almost, one, almost 40, pushing 40 years. And the neighbors around you, you've seen everything evolve in the neighborhood? I didn't hear you. You've seen everything evolve in the neighborhood, all the changes? Oh, yes. <coughs> uh huh. Because mm -hmm. this was a pretty place, though, when we, when we bought it. And the man was. Um, Furnishing the foods for Eastern, I think it was Eastern Airline, or maybe more than one airline. He was the one that supplied the foods that would go on the planes as they would take off. They were the ones that had this. And neighbors at that time that are gone now told me that out here on this side, they dug a big hole and buried the horse. So we may have the skeleton of a horse, but I didn't pursue it. And I got it from the neighbors that lived in back who were real, real nice, and they were older than me, and they'd been gone a few years. And they're the ones that told me, they said, don't ever try to dig up over there. <laughs> and I said, no, I won't. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, you said that you love art. Um, can you tell me about some of your favorite paintings? Some of my favorite? Your favorite paintings? Paintings? Yeah. From other art? people? That one is by Elliot O'Hara. Uh, no, that one's by uh, Arthur Evans, General Evans. He was um, mayor of the city of Miami. Mm -hmm. Arthur Evans, he did that one. And what about the ones that you've done? What has inspired you to paint your paintings? What inspired? What inspired you to paint the ones that you've done? Oh, because that's what I always wanted to do when I was that big. I don't know. Mother said she didn't know where it came from. But can that's mine. Yeah. Uh, can you slide one of those over and you want to tell us about it? Oh, that well, that one is. Uh, <coughs> every every one of you know where that is. So when you have the circle, sunset and. Uh, Oh, yeah. And Lejeune. And Old Uh-huh. And when you <coughs> get around the circle, right there is that. And I knew the attorney's name that was, had the house in back of that, in back of here. And I can't remember it. It makes me so provoked. It was a well-known name. Yeah. 
Well, that's not fair to have you have to hold it. <laughs> I'm like a wall. And what about that one, the, the ocean one? Oh. <clears throat> with the lighthouse. Well, <clears throat> I had a neighbor <clears throat> that was so intrigued with Trinidad, the way down there, and he wanted to see all my, my uh, photos. And he got so intrigued with it. <clears throat> and I had to go down there and bring a friend back up. And so she decided he'd go. Elderly man and neighbor. And he said he wanted to go. So my sister says, I want to go too. So the three of us flew down. And he decided <clears throat> he took a lot of pictures and he liked this one. And he gave it to me and asked me if I could pay him a picture, so I did. And when he passed away, Fred Briscoe that lived at the end of 101 Street down there. And uh, so I painted that, and that's what he wanted in the lighthouse was here. So that was a commissioned work? Yeah, yeah, but I wouldn't let him pay for it. They, they were friends. <laughs> when Ted was away in the Navy, we would play and I don't remember what the game was. It wasn't bridge. And I don't think it was canasta, whatever it was, card game. One night at our house and one night at theirs. And uh, in those days, you know, we were trying to get our yards. So we'd clean another 10 or 20 or 30 feet. And <laughs> one time they came down to our, place, our Saturday night. And he had his hand in the back, Fred Briscoe. <sighs> and he had his hand in the back of him, and he said, Oh, George, I brought you a lovely bouquet. Sandspurs. <laughs> oh, because <laughs> Dr. Palmer used to take sandspur things out of my fingers. They were, the doctors were good at that. You know, you get them in there and you try to get them out. But anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so, but he wanted a picture, so I painted him this, this is what he wanted. He had taken a, a snapshot, you know, a camera. And so, but did you, did and you then sell he, any work, any, did you sell any of your work? I hate to tell you, or I don't, shouldn't mind telling you. I won't tell either, you the Either close to, or maybe a little over a hundred thousand dollars worth. Mm -hmm. You mean over the years? Oh yeah, over the time. Uh, yeah. I don't know if anybody remembers <coughs> that down in the uh, Coconut Grove, uh, gee, I know the name of the place, where they always have the big displays where they have a yearly... Peacock Park? The what? Peacock Park? No, it's in the big building, the huge building. Convention Center. The Convention Center. Coconut Convention Park. Center, thank you, sir. <laughs> and I used to, and then we had an upstairs balcony. You could walk up, and walk around, upstairs balcony, and they always had the art display. I saw many and many a painting up there. Yeah. My husband made my frames. Let's see, not that one, not that one, not that one. Maybe the, the ones back there on the. Beside the mirror. Yes, uh huh, uh huh. And they made those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, those are by Elliot O'Hara. I have over there on the corner the history of him. He's very, very famous. He was the first watercolorist admitted to the art, whatever club it is, whatever the thing was. The others were always oil painters. And he was the first watercolorist. Admitted. I think. See. No, no, I think no, no, I've no, got. No, 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 no. You've got, you've can't do that. Can't do that. Oh my! We can't go anywhere. About that. No, no. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know it. We okay. tell oh, you that. Oh, how horrible! Um, I want to ask you if you've developed a philosophy of life that keeps you going. I think keep busy. Just keep busy. It's a whole thing. If you just always have a goal, you're going to do this. You're going to do that, and do it. I really and truly do. And I come from a family, a father and a mother both, that had that philosophy. You just never sit down and relax. 
you keep going and then when you go to sleep, you sleep. It really is, and it's true. And do you sleep well at night? Oh, good. I sleep like a babe. Yeah. Do you have any certain kind of uh, health routine or exercise or swimming or? Well, I don't do the swimming anymore because I only weigh 80 pounds or a little less. And the pool, I had a heater. Somebody else wanted it for something. I said, I never use it, take it. So. Uh, I probably still wouldn't use it, but I, I'm, I'm usually cold. Do you? See? I, but if you weigh 80 pounds and you were born in Miami, you're not going to have a problem with heat. Judy sometimes would tell me, I'm coming over, turn the air on. <laughs> Because everybody's used to air conditioning. Have we got it on now? We do. I hear it running, yeah. Uh, uh. What about diet, certain foods? Um, Uh-oh, you've got some okay. secrets. She's going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is it, Oreos or M&Ms or what do you think? It's the opposite. I don't like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but what is the name of the soup that's so good? Broccoli cheese. Broccoli mm -hmm. cheese soup. Uh, broccoli cheese soup that you get at Panera. 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 Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, so that's really what you like. Ah. You know what to bring. Uh huh. Okay. Thanks to my friend, I get it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that is good. And I do have mouth trouble, you know. Uh, from taking Fosamax. How's your blood pressure? Like 98 over 60. So you don't have to take a pill for that? No. I don't take a pill for anything. Mine's all joint, isn't it, huh? Joint on my mouth from the Fosamax. Anybody I've ever been able to tell us, oh, please don't take Fosamax. I know it, they haven't taken it off the market because there's only a, a certain percentage of us that it does this too. But it really, really is not good. Judy won't take it. Have, do you have anything that I omitted? A bread bowl from Panera, the broccoli cheese soup. Have you ever had it in a bread bowl? Have I ever had any what do? In a bread bowl, your broccoli cheese soup. It it's like this bowl made out of bread, and they just put the soup inside that bowl, and it's just like you're putting the bread inside of the soup, and it's really good. That's how I like it. Oh, you That's like it favorite. too? Yes. Uh -huh. You'll have to try that the next time. Okay, you got that one, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I, so good. I want to thank you so very much, Joyce. It's just been such a pleasure. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, it was wonderful. We just oh, loved it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, honey. Thank you. I do, I do, I, I don't deserve all this. <laughs>